shops, tours, demos, and conservation tillage was a term we used from 85 to 92. Never liked that term, because it was always way more about tillage than it was about conservation. And then we moved into that term of uh, no-till, we used that from 93 to 05. Never really liked that term, because it was always about the equipment or always about the opener. Not really about the concept and, and really what you could do with it. In 2006, we moved into the term soil health and all the outreach. Encompass can embody much more, represent it much more about what life in the soil is all about. And, I, and I'll give you an example. During that 93 to 05 range, those of you that worked in an NRCS office, we had these posters. And the poster had um, an hourglass and it had some change in paper dollars on the table that was on the poster. And you're going to move into no till systems because of time and money. That's why you were going to move into it. There was no thought given to the biological importance of it or the physical, chemical, biological importance of the function of the soil. And so you can see where some of the early thinking was and how some of that has evolved to today. Okay, so with that, let's talk a little bit about carbon and a little bit about carbon removal. And I always kind of think of North Dakota, when you look at the history of the state, it was always a place people went to take something. And so if you look in that upper left-hand corner, the early settlers gathered up the buffalo bones and train loads were shipped east. And they went for fertilizer and sugar refinement and glue and various products. But it was one of the early forms of carbon removal, old sunshine, selling something from an old sunshine process. And then in the upper right-hand corner, large portions of the eastern part of the state were settled in bonanza farms. And an entity would come in and buy up a really large tract of land. They would farm it until the yields dropped, and then they would sell it to you in individual small parcels. And tell me a downside to that, to that business plan. That was just a win-win. The only thing that lost was the resource, right? Okay, then of course the coal and oil, more old sunshine carbon. And so this has kind of been our history. And what we had to learn was, how do we build this back? How do we build carbon back? And so we knew, we knew about selling old carbon. How do we go ahead and build it back? So we started looking at something like this. If you look in the upper left-hand corner, you're going to see where the uh, atmospheric CO2, hope the North Dakota boy doesn't fall off the stage here, but you can see where it shows the atmosphere for the carbon going from the atmosphere to the vegetation. Okay? So that's the CO2 going into the stomata of a plant. Now we're going to get carbon in the soil. Okay? So follow along with me. So we got the CO2 in the atmosphere. It goes into an open stomata of a green plant. So it comes in, and out of the stomata comes oxygen and water vapor. Now the plant has carbon in it. And the plant is going to use that carbon to build itself above ground and below ground. Typical green plants, 42% carbon. Now in addition to that, it's going to give off exudates in the soil. So different plants give off different sugar exudates. Carbon. This is carbon. This is sugar into the soil. So that's the part where it shows the vegetation looping into the soil in the upper left corner, the exudates. Now they're being given off into the soil. Now the biology, soil biology, is going to consume them. So now the soil food web is consuming these carbon sugar exudates. Okay? When they do that, they're going to build the soil aggregates that, that Gabe talked about. They're going to make the glues that are holding that soil pen together in the water. Biology is going to do that part. They're also going to convert organic nutrient to inorganic. They're going to do that part. And if you have a fully functioning soil food web, they're going to move carbon into the soil organic matter. All of these are processes they do. While they're doing this, they're going to expire. So they're going to respire uh, CO2 back to the atmosphere. So it's a carbon cycle, right? So we've got to get it back to the atmosphere. And so as the biology is working, they'll respire the CO2 back to the atmosphere. Then you have the carbon cycle. 
Now the thing to keep in mind is if we have more CO2 leaving the soil than what came in through the plant, you got more leaving than what came in, the soil organic matter levels are likely going to go down. You'll notice it in the color of your soil. Your soil will become lighter. Okay. Consequently, if you've got more coming in than you have leaving, your soils are going to darken. You'll have a nicer, darker carbon look to this. And we will see gains, small tick work ticks upward in soil organic matter levels. Okay. The value of the livestock in this role is this. That plant, if you let it go to maturity, will produce X amount of carbon. If you stress that plant midway through its season with livestock and it regrows, it will harvest more carbon than if you did not have the livestock. And that's one of the big roles that livestock can play. So if you recall uh, some of the data I showed you this morning, uh, the soil monitoring data, you saw increases in carbon when the livestock were brought into graze. And then the livestock were taken off and the plant grew. group. Okay? So we are actually harvesting additional carbon. One of the big advantages of having livestock in the, in the whole scenario. Now keep in mind the amount of energy it takes. If you take a look at the, uh, on the urea line, to produce uh, 90 actual units of urea, that's 11 and a half gallons of diesel fuel equivalent energy. So you can see where the big user is for your for urea is 0.129 gallons per pound of N. Okay, so if you're going to produce 90 pounds, that's 11 and a half gallons of diesel fuel equivalent. Think about a quarter section of land seeded to a crop, fertilized with 90 units of, of urea, actual units. And then imagine 11 and a half gallons of diesel sitting in cans on each acre. Huge amount, huge amount of energy sitting there. Okay? So it gives you some idea. Phosphorus take is less. Nitrogen is so much because you're breaking the triple bond of the atmosphere again that Gabe was talking about. And so in order to do that, that's a lot of energy. So this, this uh, what, what I'm showing you is this just this production model right here required 14 and a half gallons of diesel fuel energy equivalent. That's a lot of energy. And so we're large users of energy, and when we take a look at leading into soil health, I think we can reduce this footprint, which is a significant amount of cost. In the Bakken oil field in North Dakota, we're still delivering over a million barrels a day are still coming out of the Bakken. Okay? And we had some comment the other day, or some discussion the other day, and. Uh, Slide in Kansas, uh, Gabe and myself and others, that the amount of time on Earth that we're going to use that we're going to use the petroleum products is on a timeline is one little blip. It's going to be real short on a timeline, and we have to figure this thing out and, and find our way of this. Hundred years ago, we didn't use the products, and hundred years from now, we'll probably won't again. They're there now but that is not going to stay. We know this. So let's look at some things in addition. Here's two concepts. When we moved into the no-till systems, we minimized carbon loss. If you have too much carbon in your soil, and I'm funny with you now, okay? But if you got too much carbon in your soil and you need to get rid of some, how can you accelerate the respiration going to the atmosphere? Tillage, we know this, okay? So really, instead of time and money on the, the old no-till posters, we should have been talking about the scenario to slow up the loss of carbon, slow up the loss of CO2 to the atmosphere. That would make more sense. Now, cover crops is a way to bring it back in. Okay? No-till slows up the release. The cover crops are how to maximize the input. Now, what if we did something novel like bring the two concepts together? That's when we start to see movements, upward movements in soil organic matter. It all works on a, on a plant basis, and the fibrous roots are really where the soil aggregates are formed. The large cap roots, like the brassica cap roots that Gabe showed, and he explained that. You're looking at some large inroads that they will make, 
but this is where the aggregates are formed. So if you put the two together, you put the fibrous root together with the taproot, now you get the best of both worlds. And that's another reason why the combinations work so well together, because you get the fibrous and you can go ahead and have the tap as well. Now we can see it microscopically, we can start to see the formation of the pore spaces. And Gabe mentioned that um, a soil aggregate is not a one-time thing. And Gabe mentioned four weeks, that could be something less, could be something more. Point is, they are continually needing to be reformed. One of the problems with glomalin, not necessarily a problem, but one of its characteristics is also a food. And so the biology is going to eat the glomalin. So it's a continual feed process. Now we're just gonna to touch on some of these just a bit, or just a few of the components of the soil food web so you have some thoughts in your mind. So when you're thinking of bacteria, think about decomposition of low carbon plants, like green plants, if you will. You think of them as a little bag of fertilizer. So think of the bacteria as a little bag of fertilizer that feeds on the root exudates. Everyone's got that thought in their head, okay? When you get to fungi, We'll break it into two parts, saprophytic and mycorrhizal. Now saprophytic is the principal decomposer in the world of high carbon materials. If we didn't have saprophytic fungi, we would not be able to decompose high carbon crops in the field. The corn would just stack year after year after year after year after year because there'd be nothing to decompose it. The bacteria can't knock down something that high carbon. The fungi can. And when they get it into a simpler chain, the bacteria comes in and finishes it off. Okay? So the fungi, the saprophytic is the big decomposer. The mycorrhizal is, now saprophytic is just going to work off of dead material. Litter, residue, armor, that's what it's going to decompose. Okay? Whereas the mycorrhizal, that's a live green plant. So the fungi is going to form association with the live green plant. Think of all these again as a little bag of fertilizer. Okay, both the bacteria and the fungi, small bags of fertilizer. Keep in mind the fungi is going to form the glues. So they're the, they're the glue maker. And so if you have a tillage environment, are you going to have some pretty strong glues? It's going to be tough because the hyphae network is disrupted. That's, that's the issue with glue makers. The protozoa, now you're getting into the big guys in the jungle. These are the large, the large cats in the Serengeti. And the protozoa, guess what? They're going to consume the bacteria and the fungi. Okay? Makes sense? And so they're going, to, they're going to consume those, and since those are little bags of fertilizer, they're going to end up converting them to plant-available nutrient. Now you just move from organic to inorganic plant-available nutrient. Okay? Makes sense? Because they have different CN ratios, different carbon-nitrogen ratios of the protozoa compared to the bacteria, They'll consume the bacteria and they'll excrete the excess nutrient plant available. Okay? Very, very important to have the big cats. Now another big cat is the nematode. They'll do something very similar. They'll consume the bacteria, they'll consume the fungi. They come in various sizes. Uh, they're good at transporting bacteria and fungi around the soil. You know, if you were born a bacteria, you're not going to move very far in your lifetime. But if you hook a ride on a nematode, hang on. You could go four, five inches. And just think about it in your lifetime. So, all right, you get it. The actinomycetes, that's the last one I wanted to talk about. This is where all the, uh, where the uh, sources of antibiotics come from. The tetracycline, neomycin, streptomycin, et cetera. This is their source, okay? This is, these are the antibiotics, not probiotics, but the antibiotics. And they control a lot of the bacteria in the soil. They're kind of the MPs, so that nothing gets too far out of the hand. They're good at regulating. And they also do the final decomposition and compost. So those of you that compost, the chemomycetes play a role. What does this group weigh? Well, collectively, on an acre, they could outweigh a cow-calf pair. That's if it's just a average or slightly degraded soil. If you've got a very good soil, it could be two or three compact pairs or more. So the weight on the, uh, on the below ground critters, pretty significant, okay, pretty significant. Now let's keep uh, going and keep understanding here. 
This is the one where we talked about 42% uh, carbon. So you can see on the right side, that lower pie chart uh, that, that equates from the dry matter of a plant, it's about 42% carbon. Carbon is significant, but it's the food. So when you hear carbon, think food. And then really, what difference does it make? What, is, what difference does this diversity thing make? So one of the principal, uh, one of the principal uh, textbooks in the university system in North Dakota is the uh, Nature and, and uh, Properties of Soils. And, they, and there's a quote in there that I found that kind of summed it up. The type and diversity of organic residues added to the soil can influence the type and diversity of organisms that make up the soil community. So what does it tell you? If you use one crop type, you're going to kind of favor one little bit of the soil food web, and most of it's not really going to evolve much. If you use all four crop types, are you going to influence the makeup of the soil, of the, um, soil food web community? Absolutely. And we've seen this when we run PLFAs and bottom for soils. You can see this impact. Okay? Now, years past, when we could do these PLFAs, we would have said that was a rotational impact. We got this yield bump or this quality increase from the rotational impact. And it was. But we didn't have this understanding of time. And we didn't have this information. So now to kind of illustrate that a little bit, I'm going to show you this is the tail of two, two fields here. The one on the left is a six-year no-till field. High crop diversity, cover crops, and livestock integration. The one on the right is 10 feet away. And it's a little different situation. It's six years of no-till, but it's a monoculture. So it's six years a week in a row. Do you see a difference? Plus no cover crops and no livestock integration on the right side. Do you see a difference in those two soils? If you could hold it and smell it, you would feel it and smell it as well. There's, there's a distinct difference. So when we bring in higher amounts of diversity, we bring in the covers and we bring in livestock integration, we can see we brought more carbon in. You see the darker soil. We brought more carbon in. More carbon is more food. We built more soil aggregates. We started to get rid of the compaction, the horizontal compaction lines on the right side. So we start to make these differences. So we learned, we learned that the uh, plant takes the CO2 in through the stomata. That's the start of bringing carbon to the soils. And that part of the carbon is used to grow the plant, and part is used as an exudate. Have you tasted the exudates? Have you tasted them? Because you can do that. Next year, we have a cornfield in Colorado, before it tassels out, dig up a plant. And we do this at the Minokan farm when groups come through. If I like the group, I wash off the roots a little bit before I ask you to taste them. I don't care that much for the group, then I just hand them to them. So you take that, you dig up that corn plant, and uh, you can clean off the root mass a bit and dip off the ends of the plump root mass and taste it. And you will taste this pure sugar carbon taste. It's very pure, it's very sweet, it tastes like peas. Many times when people tell me it tastes like peas. So when you taste that, you will understand it's giving off sugar for the soil food web. Bring the soil food web next to it. And then the process starts with the biology. It's an age-old process and developed over time. So the, CO, the soil releases the CO2 back into the atmosphere. Now that comes primarily from the soil food web and root respiration. The root mass, anything that's decomposing with all that large amount of carbon in it, can go to CO2. Okay? And so we start to return the carbon cycle. I had an individual, uh, I did an interview with the magazine not too long ago, and the interviewer says to me, it's really great that you're working on global warming. And I said, I need to clarify. I said, when we moved into soil health, we wanted to sequester the CO2 by bringing carbon into the soil because we had depleted our soils of carbon so badly. The fact that it's maybe benefiting CO2 by lesser amounts in the atmosphere, I said, that's admirable, but I'll be honest with you, it's not why we did. And so if it came along later that it's also positive for, for uh, global warming and wonderful. But the reason we did it was to uh, give ourselves to build soils and give ourselves resiliency in our crop and grazing systems. So the carbon cycle, the picture on the left 
with the green equipment instead of green steel, we need a green plant. That's the, that's the no pun intended, but the irony of it all. And so, okay. so you look at that, we're accelerating the release of CO2 to the atmosphere, but we have no way on the left side to bring it back. We can't bring carbon in in this, in this uh, photo. And so it's, it's strictly one of leaving and leaving more rapidly. And then on the right side, you can see those two smaller peds to your left, those two smaller swords there. Uh, those are kind of defining the first half of my career. And there you're looking at uh, perennial grasses kept too short to effectively harvest sunlight and CO2. Not enough recovery time. And then the root mass suffers. Now the ones on the right have a, have a much larger leaf for harvesting sunlight and bringing CO2 in. And then consequently you get the larger biomass for the root. And so you can see the different concepts. Keep in mind too that about a third of the carbon is in the grain, about a third is in the residue, and about a third is in the root mass. So when you think about carbon, you think about it in those one third, one third, one third. Now to illustrate that, my wife and I were driving through Minnesota last fall at harvest time. And we came across the combine harvesting wheat. No problem. It's taking a third of the carbon, right? For human consumption, etc. We can work with this. We can replace that carbon in the cover crop. We can do that. Well, we drove a little bit further and we came across this uh, lower left photo. Now they took the grain and then they bailed up the residue and they've taken the residue. So now they took two thirds. And then we drove a little bit further and we came across that, that photo to the far right. Well, there they took a third of the grain, they took a third of the carbon from the residue, and they're making a big impact on the remaining carbon and the root mass for the tillage. So there really was very little carbon left. And there's our issue, because now we don't have food. Now there's no food for the biology. Now they're forced to eat the blow mail-in and all those type things, and, and we end up with fewer pore spaces in our soils as our soils decompress. And at that point in time, I think I said to my wife, we need to pull in and dinner somewhere, so we have to wait till it's sundown, and I can't see out the side of the car anymore, and then we can drive back to Disney. North Dakota came into, or excuse me, uh, Chevrolet came into North Dakota fall of, um, I believe it was in 14, and uh, there we are, November 14, and they made carbon deals with uh, 23 different farmers in the state. And so I think big industry is starting to show some interest in carbon as well. Chevrolet did explain they've done nothing wrong, they're just being good people buying carbon. Okay. But it, it illustrates the importance that I think that big industry is starting to show. I kind of want to show you a couple of thin sections also. These, uh, uh, the uh, sheet of paper is about 100 microns thick, and a thin section of soil that is cut for this purpose is about 30 microns thick, so that's a very, very thin slice of soil. Those of you that are older remember the old Jinsu knife uh, commercial where you cut the meat so thin the in-laws would come back, remember that? <laughs> so this is very thin, and it allows us to look at pore spaces. Now, this is a uh, uh, conventional tillage, low porosity, pore structure soil, which doesn't mean anything to us until we look at the next one of native rangeland. Now we see one of the native rangeland and we start to see a whole different story on four spaces. So it's an illustration. If you look at it in a spade, this is just a photo of a spade going into a first year no-till field last summer. You see the horizontal compression lines where the tillage ran. In nature, if you go into native rangeland, you go into the forest, you won't find those horizontal layers. Those horizontal layers come from compaction. They get there, there when man gets involved. So it kind of shows you what the what the thin sections showed you under a microscope. Okay. And so just a little bit more on, on bulk density for the soils people, like like Dave. And and uh, when I look at the ten fields at the Minokin farm, there's one of them that's continuous wheat. That's field three. 
and which one has the highest bulk density. If you are a soil and you have a high bulk density, that means you don't have any pore spaces, okay? And your infiltration is gonna be really poor. In the fall, just before freeze up, I take these uh, big plastic tubs and I fill them full of soil and I bring them into the building for, so I can use them over the winter for soil demonstrations. I can kind of tell which ones are gonna infiltrate the best when I'm carrying them you know, to the vehicle. How do I know? I can tell by weight, yeah. When we compress the soil and take the pore spaces out, the soil gets heavier, okay? So we can tell by weight. So the highest bulk density in field three would be the poorest infill tree. They're all 10 no-till fields, but one's a monoculture. Okay. Does it impact our ability to build soil aggregates and pore spaces? Yes. Consequently, the infiltration. So it does connect. Just a little bit on some of the soil health principles. Armor, this is North Dakota. When we're armored up, we're pretty stable. When we're not armored up, like on the right side, we're not so stable. Now it's 2016 and we haven't got our hands around, around erosion yet. And in the western part of the state, we've got some similar issues to that. Or if we take a look at soils with no armor, this is a no-till field, but there's no armor. And it's corn silage field every year. And when you walk on that field, you would swear you're walking on concrete. It will feel positively like concrete. You can see the problem the planter had, trying to get a uniform depth and spacing. You can see the problems the planter had. It's a no-till field, but it doesn't mean anything because it doesn't have any diversity, it has no armor. It doesn't have the foundation principles. So if we look at carbon on the soil, we can have the live plants, which will harvest the CO2, and we can have the dead litter as armor, and they both are a food source. One of them is harvesting CO2, but they both have carbon in them, and we need them both. So if we take a look at a fall cover crop at the Minokan farm, you can see the, the dark colored residue from the, from the fall harvest, and then you can see the new cover crop, which is green. So there you got both of them together. One's providing protection. One of the biggest issues we have in production agriculture is rainfall and bare soils. Rainfall and bare soils compact. So if we don't have, if we aren't armored up, they're going to compact. All they need is rainfall. This is right after uh, corn planting at the Minoka farm. I had to wait for that train to go by because I wanted the train there so you can see the old sunshine carbon and now the new. So you can see them. Yeah, 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 okay. Okay, all right, I like that. <laughs> that was, uh, the, that carbon, that residue, that armor on the surface, by the end of August, was pretty much gone. But it made it, it made it come out the end of August. I and mean, then the biology just consumed it. So disturbance, if you get a chance, uh, Google wake up call, NDSU, wake up call, NDSU, North Dakota State University. It's an article that was written by uh, Dr. Dave Franzen that really puts uh, soil degradation in perspective. It's like a two-page article where they, after 25 years, went back to the same spot and then reanalyzed the same soil and saw how much less topsoil we had and how that soil had degraded after 25 years of production ag. This is important, but that article helps put it in perspective for you because soil degradation is subtle. But after a 25-year period, on paper, it'll jump right off the page at you. This was an interesting shot. One of my friends uh, sent this to me. This is uh, right outside of Fargo in the Red River Valley. And that's a uh, full sunshine day. And the wind erosion was so bad, there were call-ins to the local radio station. And one of the call-ins said, this is a, this is." Um, some dark material that must be coming out of the Bakken oil field. <laughs> Serious. No, it's not coming out of the Bakken oil field. This is topsoil coming right off of our crop land. This is a serious item. Otherwise, we get uh, to the point where this field is. There's no carbon left on the, on the hilltops. And everything is moved down. And then we have the water quality issues as well. So we have to make that choice to control it before then. So this is what I want to see. I want to see some good residue. Have it armored up. 
And then we gotta make this choice. You can pull iron or you can push carbon. You gotta decide which one you're gonna do. So the plant diversity, we talked about this. We have an understanding now that the diversity in the plants equates to the diversity in the soil food web. There's a direct correlation. Gabe covered these crop types. They're different for everyone. But we want to visit a little bit about the carbon-nitrogen ratio and explain something. And Gabe mentioned the uh, corn-soybean rotation. So let's just use that example, okay? That corn-soybean rotation at one time probably included a small grain. When Grandpa had the land, it probably had a small grain in it, like wheat or barley or oat or something like that, in addition to the corn and beans. So what's the difference today? Okay, well, let me show you what the difference is. If you take a look at this uh, list, this is the carbon-nitrogen ratio of plants. The carbon-nitrogen or the ratio of the soil is about 10 to 1. And where that comes from is from every 1% soil organic there's 10,000 units of carbon and 1,000 units of organic nitrogen in every 1%. You do the math in North Dakota between the 10,000 and the 1,000, you get the 10 to 1 ratio. Okay? So the CN ratio of the soil is 10 to 1. Now, let's look at this. Wheat is, is really high CN ratio, a lot of chewing for the microbes. Okay? About 80 to 1, a lot of carbon, hence a lot of food. Corn is about 57 to 1. Now, soybean isn't on here, but soybean would be somewhere around 25 to 1, close, maybe a little bit less. Okay, so you can see the original rotation probably had wheat real high, corn kind of mid, soybean kind of, kind of low, because they all have to decompose down to 10 to 1 of what the soil is. So if a deer dies in your field, it has to decompose down to 10 to 1. Parts of the deer will decompose very quickly, antlers and hooves take a little bit longer, but they will get to 10 to 1 also. Now, take the wheat out. Now you just have the corn bean. What did you do to the amount of food that used to go to that soil? You dramatically reduced it. Dramatically. There again lies one of the big issues with the corn bean rotation over time. This isn't something that shows up the day you do this. This is something that shows up over time. The soil degradation is subtle. But now that we've been at a corn bean rotation for so many years in parts of the nation, that therein lies the issues of water quality and erosion and salinity. Those are, those are the issues. We don't have enough food for the biology. There's not enough food to build a soil aggregate that looks like that. We can build this one, no problem. And we're building this one rapidly. But we aren't building many of those. And it takes carbon to do that. So now we have a scenario where on that rotation, you look at the CN ratio and understanding again, the CN ratio of the soil is about 10 to 1. <coughs> Everything has to decompose down to that 10 to 1 off of this chart. The higher you are up on it, the more food you have, and the longer it takes to decompose. So you look at that whole situation and it comes and it boils down to a lack of food for the biology. Keep in mind now that same corn bean rotation in the U.S. is typically tillage, typically no cover crops, typically no livestock. So we, we don't have very many tools to work with. So how do we put those four into place? That's really what we're looking at. So I'm just going to touch a little bit, uh, how am I doing on time? Like, uh, well, Seventeen. Make up your mind. Which is it? <laughs> okay, we'll go with sixteen. Okay, I want to end up this part here on covers of livestock integration. Again, think of covers as annual, biannuals, and perennials. One of the reasons I'm such a strong advocate of perennials is because nothing builds soil aggregates better than perennials. Perennials build in quicker, and we can go ahead and restore quicker. Also, one of the big resource concerns that we work with in North Dakota is salinity, especially in the east half of North Dakota. Every five years, we do a new salinity map. And guess what is the change every five years? Dave, you want to guess? It's a larger area that's impacted every five years. Salinity management is water management. And what it's telling you is that you have more water than plant. And we 
and you have that situation, you will, be, you will have salinity issues. So I propose we bring in rotational perennials into our cropland as well. And so at the Minokin farm, where I spent my summers, we have two fields now seeded to perennials. One that we raised in 15, and the second one will be online to start grazing in 17. And there's 10 fields, two of them are perennials, and we will rotate them through and possibly leave them in place for five years or six years, somewhere in there. So we go ahead and why we're going to do them, it's identified, fortunately, our livestock crop. We have 20, 20 yearlings and three ewes uh, at the Monokan farm over the summer. And when we introduce them, those of you that are accustomed to those two groups, what do you think the ewes did when they saw the yearlings? They ran toward their flock animal. They ran toward the yearlings. What do you think the yearlings did when they saw the sheep coming out? They turned around and they put a lot of pressure on the four wire fence. They were going to get away from them. But after two days, they were all bonded up. Now, I like to go in with high plant diversity, warm seasons, cool seasons, flowering forms, because these are components that were there and are still there, you go to Gabe's native rangeland, you're going to find all these, and many more. He might have 100 plus species. Here I'm just working with 21. So I'm trying to more closely mimic the original landscape in terms of plant diversity, because keep in mind, we know every one of them gives off a different, a different exudate. Every one of them is a different organic material. Every one of them helps improve the soil food web. So those 21 species were put in place, we're now grazing them. We have 12 acre fields, and so we used about 12 paddocks, and so they would get an acre at a time, roughly three days in that acre, okay? I didn't like, I didn't want to have regrowth, I didn't want to graze and regrowth, and so in our environment, after three days, if you have some moisture, you're probably going to get regrowth. And we took 30 to 40 percent of the material, and we used a cell center, so we had a tank water tank with a little fence around it called the cell center that we hook onto our single wire electric and move it every three days. When the yearlings went into that paddock, the Holsteins were not happy because they were pin raised. And they went around that paddock until they found the cell center. And when they found that little cell center, they went in there and laid down and didn't want to come out because it was the closest thing they could find to how they were raised. They had never been out of the tent. So you know, it's, you know, it's part of their, how they grew up. Once the Red Angus joined them, no problems, everybody went out and grazed. Uh, let's see here. Something I think we need to do more of is observe. And, and what I did is I just sat down with my phone and I waited for him to come over to me. And because I wanted to see what out of those 21 species are they eating? What are they taking first? What are they taking second or third? What are they coming back for that they previously grazed that it appears that they really liked? And how are they doing this? Are they having stress or not? And so it was just an opportunity to keep in mind, I get, I get actually paid for this. And so <laughs> I'm sitting there observing them. And you know they, that observation is something that Grandpa was good at, Dad had some skills at, to the present day, there are a lot of people who don't have that skill. And so it's something that I'm trying to gain myself. In addition, I could hear all the birds and all the insects, because it was just alive. And so it was, it was observation and watching the selection process. And, and you know, when you put 21 species out, what are they going to take? And, and what are they not so interested in? And so that was just uh, one of the items that, that I really enjoyed. I think that's about 90, 90 seconds or so. And from that, we had the opportunity to learn. And you can see we had a pretty good stand, and we had a lot of biomass material. And so turning them out there and, and watching them as they would come into a new setting was very interesting. What did they, like? they really liked the metal roam. Uh, they would come back, they would select it, and they would graze some other species, but invariably they'd come back and grab the metal brome again. And so that was uh, an indication to me that, that that definitely was pretty pretty high on the list. 
This is what I want it to look like when we come out. I don't want to see the soil. So when they're done at the end of three days, I want to look straight down. I don't want to see the soil. Okay, I want it armored up. Now, depending on if I'm in nesting season or what's going on, that's maybe as flat as I'll make it. It depends, again, what time of year it is and what's nesting and what isn't. So we'll kind of, we can adjust that density of animals. Now, this is the, the uh, same herd uh, grazing a warm season cover crop combination. And you can see the bird mass there. So somebody mentioned uh, regarding the volunteer grain. And you have bird densities like this. Volunteer grains. You know, you've got crickets and crabbit beetles, you've got birds, you've got, you got light. And when you have that, I really haven't seen much issue with that. Also, if we take a look at birds, how many birds do you see? You see the one on the U, and then there's three of them sitting right in front of you. And they're just sitting there. And it's like everybody's kind of a community. So it's just kind of interesting to observe them, interesting to watch them. So then we also brought them into these cool season mixes, and this allowed me to monitor the carbon impacts. Because they're going to top this mix. What do you think they're gaining a day on there? Pretty good, yeah. Next year I got the ability to weigh. I didn't have a scale this year, but next year I can weigh. And so that's going to allow me to weigh them before and after, and we can also get the weights down. But um, you can see the whole schemes work out pretty good because they're pretty tall. They can see around, and then the red angus would follow them. And you got to trust me now, but there's pretty use in there too. You just, you just trust me, they're in there. Now, uh, Gabe was talking about uh, the dung beetles as well. You can see how I spend my days. <laughs> now, the young beetles are really important, but they can have up to a dozen mites on them. And if they have the mites on them, they become way more valuable. And so as the dung beetle flies in, the mites jump off, and there's a difference in the approach now. The dung beetle is interested in the dung. The mites are interested in the fly larvae. Are the mites play a big role? A real big role. Yeah, real big role. This is one square meter. That bottom tube is one square meter of surface life at the Minokin farm. And so you set up one square meter and you collect everything that you can that's alive on the surface of the soil in that one square meter. And uh, Jonathan Lundgren and his grad students did this, and, and uh, that upper tube was from a, another farm in another state, but it was a uh, very low diversity. The bottom tube was at the Minoka farm that just filled it up with light. I never used to think about the surface light. But there's a huge world right there on the surface of the soil. Now this is kind of what a fall grassy, uh, excuse me, a fall cover crop looks like at the Minokin farm. It has a nice start here, just getting rolling. And most of the activity is below the soil. Okay? So even if the plant isn't real big above the soil, it's the root mass below the soil that's putting the CO2 in the soil that we're interested in. And then also we use some of these. Um, Covers that were grazed, this is the cover, full season cover that's grazed earlier, where the whole steams were sticking up above the oats, okay? Now this is grazing in the second time. This is the regrowth. And so what they're grazing here is the annual ryegrass and the brassicas and the vetch. You know, the regrowth coming up through the, uh, the dead liver. So you can see kind of how that works. And then I do a little work at the Minokin farm to mimic that. And I'll uh, 
roll it, and I'll put some compost on that cover, and I'll compare that to where the cattle graze the cover on the other half of the field. Right now, the cattle are leading in terms of carbon sequestration. So we can try to mimic them, but it's pretty hard to do what a cow does. Okay? We talked about this earlier, uh, same set of books, etc. So with that, I'm going to tie a knot here. Uh, Mike and turn it back to you. I don't know if we have time for a question or two or not. We do. A couple questions if you if you want. Say again. Okay, solidity, uh, there's a couple of different approaches for it. We know when we bring perennials in, we can make solidity, we can manage solidity, okay? We also know that if we bring uh, rye up to a cover crop, even if it's a monoculture, it's saline resistant. And so rye is a good choice if you want to have a starting cover. Uh, rye, would, rye would be a good choice from the viewpoint of helping to manage water in a saline scenario. So rye, as far as annuals, perennials, we can manage it completely. We just have more water than plant. That's our issue. And we have too long of periods after harvest where there's nothing growing in most of the standard production model. And that solidity is, is an issue. Jay Bird. For um, grass finish operations, David mentioned that um, you'd hit them, you'd go into that forage before it set seed. How do you how do you plan for that if you're growing things like oats or? Um, yeah, we're we're not growing. You know, we're not raising grass finish, at least not at this point. Uh, if we were, I would have brought them in there much earlier. Like uh, the cool season mix they were grazing was about 10 species, but you can see the oak was real prominent. Yeah, if we were looking at a grass finish, they would have been in there three weeks earlier. Absolutely. It's management. Or just leave that out. Yeah, or leave, or leave the oak part out of the mix. Another option. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Now, in this case, we weren't managing for grass finish, but if we were, that would be our thing. Any other questions? This is a perfect time. Everybody understands how they're going to bring carbon into their soils. That's the key today. So if you got that down, good things will happen. It's nice visiting, right? Thank you, Jay.